This video has been brought to you by the generous channel members and lads over at Patreon. Thank you all for supporting me and my content. In the tumultuous landscape of the late 20th century, a violent series of events unfolded in the heart of the Balkans that continues to shape the region even today. What I am referring to is none other than the breakup of Yugoslavia. This event, while also being pretty complicated for people who are not familiar with the region, is also a pretty controversial topic, especially among those from the area. You will definitely hear different stories depending on who you ask. One will say that it was specifically Slovenians, Croats and Bosniaks who were at fault, the other will say that it was the Serbs who caused it, and then the third will go on about how the breakup of Yugoslavia was a western conspiracy backed by the CIA to destroy a proud and strong nation in the heart of Europe. As for me? Well, considering the fact that I am an ethnic Bosniak, Muslim, and by the title of the video, I believe one could already guess on which team I am on, and I am fully aware of my bias, on the contrary I fully embrace it, since I genuinely care about my beliefs and want to defend them, instead of giving them up for the sake of being unbiased. So today, I am willing to offer my perspective on the breakup of Yugoslavia, that it was in fact Serbian nationalism that caused the disintegration in the first place, and that Bosniak and Croatian nationalism was just a defense mechanism against this enemy that threatened them and their country. Alongside that, I will also be talking about Serbian nationalism itself during that time, and how what it meant to be Serbian drastically changed with the slow decline of the country and the rise of chauvinistic elements. Even if Tito managed to somehow hold the nation together and suppress regional nationalism, the moment Tito died in 1980, Yugoslavia's fate was sealed, and it was only a question of time when the powder keg was going to explode, which it would only 12 years later. And with this video, I am aiming to give you all an idea on what truly transpired. The national question of Yugoslavia was immediately asked after Tito passed away in May 1980, and this question mainly came from the Serbian academic and political circles. Specifically, the constitution of 1974 came under criticism not long after Tito passed away, stating how the constitution was unfair towards the Serbian people and how it was an injustice. In September 1986, the Serbian Academy for Science and Arts, also known as SANU, published a memorandum in the Belgrade newspaper. This memorandum would infamously become known as the SANU Memorandum, as it would call for drastic structural changes in Yugoslavia. It would first begin as an analysis of the Yugoslav crisis and end with a proposal for a Serbian national program. The Sanu Memorandum was already highly controversial, because out of the blue, these sorts of questions could be openly discussed, and now they even had a rubber stamp of approval from the highest branch of the State Academy. Kenneth J. Campbell, in his book Genocide and the Global Village, would state that the memorandum, quote, explicitly stated that the Serbs were the most oppressed people in Yugoslavia and therefore they must live together in a greater Serbia or disappear. The Sanu Memorandum had exactly two purposes. It was a de facto program of Serbian intellectuals to expand the borders of Serbia within Yugoslavia, and it would promote the idea that Serbs are in life-threatening danger and portray the Serbs as eternal victims throughout history where they must stand together at all cost. Even the president of Serbia at the time, Ivan Stambolic, was quick to condemn the memorandum, stating how he was, quote, Appalled by the inciting content of the memorandum, I immediately warned that the memorandum would unleash a tidal wave of violence and bloodshed. Stambolic would continue to say how the memorandum envisioned a homogenization of Serbia and Serbs, how Yugoslavia was the biggest obstacle for them because it gave rights to ethnic minorities and prevented the creation of an ethnically homogenous Serbian state. 
Despite the fact that Stambolic publicly denounced the memorandum as calling for blood and violence, the contents of the memorandum would still be spreading around like wildfire, as many Serbs would embrace it as their unofficial manifesto. And soon enough the supporters of the Sanu memorandum would reach political relevance. One of the most famous open supporters of the Sanu Memorandum at that time was Serbian politician Slobodan Milosevic. Milosevic would defeat Ivan Stambolic at the 8th Congress of the Serbian League of Communists, officially becoming the next president of the League of Communists of Serbia. With Milosevic now in such a high position of power, he would do everything he could to make the goals of the memorandum a reality. And with this, the Serbian League of Communists would go into opposition within Yugoslavia, now that their policies were set around national homogenization. Soon after going into opposition, Milosevic's political opponents within the party were quickly dealt with, further solidifying his rule over the Serbian League of Communists. Along with this, Milosevic legalized the discussion of many taboo topics which were forbidden under Tito, and established close relations with both the Serbian Academy for Science and Arts and the Serbian Orthodox Church. Milosevic, however, could not carry out his vision on the spot. His biggest obstacle was the political structure of Yugoslavia. As you all know, Yugoslavia was a federation, meaning that, for example, Serbia could not directly change any laws in Croatia and vice versa since they were equal when it comes to political power. So now Milosevic set out his new plan, to change Yugoslavia's politics from the inside. Specifically, Milosevic aimed to rewoke the Yugoslav Constitution of 1974 and return to the Constitution between 1945 and 1971, for a very simple reason. The 1974 Constitution established the autonomous regions of Kosovo and Vojvodina, and Milosevic aimed to abolish their autonomy and bring them back into the fold of the Socialist Republic of Serbia. In an effort to gain more political power outside Serbia proper, Milosevic started assigning his lackeys in high positions of power within Vojvodina, Kosovo and even Montenegro, which was a separate federal unit. This would result in the infamous anti-bureaucratic revolution, where the governments of these three territories were replaced with pro-Milosevic supporters. The anti-bureaucratic revolution was very much noticed by the governments of Slovenia, Croatia and Bosnia, which all recognized what kind of danger Milosevic represented. Because now, if Milosevic managed to get Macedonia on his side and also strong-arm the Serbian population of Bosnia, he could easily have a 4-2 majority in the Congress and change the general constitution of Yugoslavia. Slovenian intellectuals were especially worried about this, since they saw this as a danger to their entire people and nation, which led to Slovenia being the primary opposition to Milosevic in his fight for centralism. In 1986, Milosevic embarked on perhaps his boldest move yet, as the Yugoslavian government started announcing changes to the military apparatus of the country, specifically the Yugoslav People's Army. The Yugoslav People's Army was primarily dominated by Serbs and Montenegrins, with the chief of staff having a similar breakdown as well. However, there is one part of the army that Serbs did not have full control over, and that was the territorial defense. The territorial defense was similar to the role of a national guard, specifically a sort of paramilitary force of each socialist republic, who they were all entitled to. Unlike the central components of the Yugoslav People's Army, the territorial defenses were not necessarily Serbian dominated, and their composition depended on the republic they were stationed at. For example, the Croatian territorial defense was majority Croat, the Slovenian one Slovenian, and the Bosnian one Bosniak. For these reasons, the Yugoslavian government announced a reorganization of the army, aiming to centralize the Yugoslav People's Army further. In 1987, all the other socialist republics lost their right to command their respective branches of the territorial defense, and the republics were unconstitutionally kicked out of the command chains of the territorial defense. For example, in Bosnia between 1988 and 1990, the territorial defense was made radically smaller, and then in the end the Yugoslav People's Army carried out a complete disarmament of the forces, confiscating all the weapons and ammunition from the territorial defense warehouses and transferring them over to the barracks of the Yugoslav People's Army. 
Obviously, this reorganization of the army was not just militarily driven, but also politically. By disarming the territorial defense and centralizing the Serbian-dominant Yugoslav People's Army, it would give more military power to Milosevic and his allies, and in case of a war, the other republics would be significantly outgunned with fewer chances and ways of fighting back. The Serbian Orthodox Church, just like throughout history, has played a major role in strengthening Serbian nationalism and chauvinism, for one specific reason. You see, if we for example take Islam and Catholicism, we will see that they are primarily international religions, where anyone of any culture or ethnic background could become a believer. However, Orthodox Christianity is a more complicated story. Orthodox Christianity is not a religion that is as centralized as Catholicism or Islam. It is rather decentralized among various Orthodox churches within different nations. And because of this decentralization among various nations and ethnic groups, it can lead to the church having roots in their country's respective nationalism. The most extreme example of this is the Serbian Orthodox Church, which is firmly rooted in Serbian nationalism, and doesn't have that international character that other religions have. Rather, it is a religion by Serbs, of Serbs, and for Serbs, which is something Serbian Patriarch Pavle stated, quote, Being a Serb means being obligatory Orthodox Christian. A Serb cannot be an atheist, an unbaptized Serb cannot go. Because of this reason, the Serbian Orthodox Church always played a key part when it came to the development of Serbian nationalism throughout history, and always was in some way involved with actions connected with Serbian national programs. And in the age of Milosevic, this was not an exception. It was obvious why Milosevic would want to establish close relations with the Orthodox Church from the start in order to further his goals for establishing a more centralized Yugoslavia. One of the most notable things the Orthodox Church has done was further romanticize the famous Battle of Kosovo which took place in 1398 against the Ottoman Turks. Although the battle was won by the Ottomans in the end, this event is still extremely important in both Serbian historiography and Serbian nationalism in general. For this reason, Vidovdan, which is the Serbian national and religious holiday which celebrates Prince Lazar and the Serbs who fell on the battlefield, is also very important. According to historian Miodrag Popovic in his book Vidovdani Chasni Kirst, quote, According to the myth, Vidovdan was a day of heroic deeds, victory and triumph over evil. In the new cult, formed under the pressure of political and economic imperatives of Serbian bourgeoisie, the penetration into the south and the conquest of Kosovo, Vidovdan primarily became a symbol of bloody and merciless revenge against everything Turkish, Muslim in general. In this distorted myth, Right from the beginning, an internal stratification of the Kosovo myth occurs, whereby the poetic gives away to concrete national politics. Which is why in 1989, the Serbian Orthodox Church received permission to take the remains of Prince Lazar and parade them all throughout the various Serbian monasteries in Serbia, Bosnia, Croatia and Kosovo, as Serbs gathered to pray in front of him. According to anthropologist Catherine Virgery, with this tour, the future borders of a greater Serbia were drawn. Quote, the skeleton of Prince Lazar established the boundaries of greater Serbia based on the principle of Serbian land is where Serbian bones are. By parading the remains of illustrious individuals, their specific biographies were used to re-examine the destiny of the nation. A year later, in 1990, the Serbian Orthodox Church received a new patriarch, Pavle, who I quoted early on. And during the ceremony, Metropolitan Vladislav would openly denounce the ideas of Yugoslavia and brotherhood and unity. Quote, As if everything is in the interest of brotherhood and unity, while we have lost everything that is Serbian, the same will happen in other regions where Serbs are a minority, where they want us to exist only as Serbs of the Catholic faith or as Croats of the Roman Catholic faith. That cannot be. 
it must not be allowed. We place great hopes in you and have great trust because love guides you. On behalf of all Archbishops, we raise this toast for the health and long life of our new Patriarch, Pavle. With the help of the Orthodox Church, the idea was ingrained in the consciousness of Serbian people that Communism, Catholicism and Islam had conspired against Serbhood and Orthodoxy, and that this establishment needed to be fought against. It was a clear return of the Serbian population to the faith of Saint Sava, leaving room for a crusade against Communism, Catholicism and Islam, which was only welcomed by Milosevic's regime. Serbian nationalism is a very specific kind of nationalism that history has always seen, called traumatic nationalism. Traumatic nationalism would be defined as a kind of nationalism where the nation and people focus on a specific injustice and suffering that has happened to them by the hands of another nation and another people. And this nationalism aims to fix this injustice and make it right again through a motivation and sense of revenge against those who they see wronged them. Again, traumatic nationalism has been observed many times throughout history, and it is a normal part of the way human mentality works. For example, the defeat of France at the hands of the Prussians and the taking of Alsace-Lorraine in 1871 that fueled French nationalism towards taking their taken territory back, or Germany after the Treaty of Versailles being utterly humiliated and broken after the First World War, which enabled Adolf Hitler and the NSDAP to take power or Hungary losing two-thirds of their territory after the Treaty of Trianon, which haunts the nation to this very day. But there is one major difference that sets Serbian nationalism apart from other examples of traumatic nationalism. Usually, nations will specifically focus on one event and one period of history where this great injustice and humiliation was inflicted on them, and they aim to bring back their old glory from before this humiliation took place. However, Serbian nationalism, instead of focusing on this one period of history, actually paints the entirety of Serbian historiography as a time of great suffering and humiliation. This gives the illusion that Serbs were, from the very beginning of their history, this eternal victim that always had a target painted on its back. And what is even more interesting is that this is a very recent phenomena, and American academic Sabrina P. Ramit would describe it in the best way possible. Quote, when a nation recalls its past as filled with suffering, catastrophes and calamities, and views the world as menacing, the result is traumatic nationalism. In the turbulent years following 1986, Serbian nationalism acquired a specifically traumatic reflection, drawing its energy, out of habit and by nature, from the reinterpretation of Serbian history in terms of suffering, exploitation, pain and injustice. Serbian nationalism was not always traumatic, it only became so as a result of successful manipulation by the elite. This is another thing that sets Serbian nationalism apart from other examples of traumatic nationalism, the specific way it manifested. In normal cases, it manifests right after these tragedies, but in the case of Serbian nationalism, it didn't manifest right after these atrocities and events took place, but rather it manifested over hundreds of years later from the many offices of Serbian academies. As was mentioned, Serbian nationalism taking this very traumatic outlook on its own history is a very recent phenomena that is strong to this very day. It was only through the successful manipulation of Serbian elites, Milosevic and the Church, that the entire meaning of what being a Serb is shifted dramatically in such a short period, manipulating and changing the entire way Serbs look at their own history. And undoubtedly, this kind of nationalism is one of the most dangerous ones, as it puts suffering and revenge on the very top of ambitions, which would show its ugly face in the events that would transpire in a few years. 
Even if you perhaps believe that Yugoslavia's demise was caused by something else, it is an objective fact that Serbian nationalism played a significant, if not the biggest role in its destruction. And as I mentioned in the very beginning, the rise of Slovenian, Croatian and Bosniak nationalism was simply a defensive response against the wave that was bound to hit them and their countries. But in the end, I don't believe in any kind of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was an artificial creation that could have never survived on its own without the use of brute force to keep the radicalism at bay as Tito had done. Despite not being a fan of Tito myself, I at least respect the fact that he tried his best to keep this mess afloat and managed to succeed at it. And the moment Tito let out his last breath was the moment Yugoslavia's fate would be sealed, as the Serbian elites, especially Milosevic, tried their best to turn Yugoslavia into a greater Serbian state that would only benefit the Serbs at the expense of every other ethnic and religious minority. Because this supposed oppression the Serbian people faced during the era of Tito never existed in reality. They were just mad at the fact that ethnic minorities started gaining more rights and political power to manage their own affairs. And even to this day, the Serbian variation of traumatic nationalism is stronger than ever before, as their actions and ambitions during the Yugoslav Wars led to consequences that could not be just ignored. And as always, it is only a matter of time until the powder keg would start exploding for a second time.